Hi, I'm Bob the Hollow, here to talk about the factions that were once entrenched in war for control over Yarnan, the Eldritch Knowledge, and the communion with the Great Ones, Bergenworth, the Healing Church, the School of Mansis, and the Choir. There exists the assumption that Bergenworth and the Healing Church are two separate institutions. There exists the assumption that Lawrence founded the Healing Church despite William's wishes. But before there was a grand cathedral, there was a research hall. At the beginning and at the front of both institutions there was Willan, and before Willan there was already blood. The base game already alluded to this connection via the sedative's description. Liquid medicine concocted at Bergenworth, thick human blood serves to calm the frayed nerves. Naturally, this often leads to reliance on blood ministration. And also, with the presence of a church giant inside Bergenworth's lecture building, but these were too insubstantial to claim such connections went any deeper than that. The Hunter's Nightmare, however, changed all that. In order to start unveiling how the DLC explains the history of Yarnon's most prominent institution, one must first understand how the Hunter's Nightmare relates to the passage of time. Remember that the Nightmare is very symbolic, and thus the lines are blurred. Being a higher plane means that time itself is just another dimension. Up, down, past, future. Space and time are all just different ways of looking at the same picture. You start at the Cathedral Ward, and as you make your way through the Nightmare, you are making your way into the past. The beginning of this Nightmare's history is at its very end, with Kos, dead on a beach, and the offspring that was taken from it. As such, any information prior to this point can only be implied, it will not be told. The Hunters proceeded to slaughtering the inhabitants of the fishing hamlet, the discovery of this great one led to the research hall and its experiments with sea water. The revelations of these experiments led to the arcane and even more accentuated blood experimentations that culminated with the outbreak of the Scourge of the Beast in the death of Lawrence, first vicar of the Healing Church. This lays the framework through which we are going to be analyzing the events and clues presented by the DLC, though, at the moment, our only concern is to establish the lore of the Church's creation and its connection to Willan of Bergenworth. The fishing hamlet was besieged by German's hunters, but the villagers don't curse the healing church with their uncanny prayers, do they? No, they don't. They curse Bergenworth's blood-crazed things. So, despite the involvement of the church, Bergenworth was the institution ahead of it all. In the village, the church's involvement can be surmised by the presence of the Herald Satan Brother, and in the research hall, their presence is indicated by the facts that they already had a communion room, that Adeline used to be a blood saint, that they have church hunters, blood ministers and church servants, even though the building itself was to the research hall. At that point in time, they were a single institution, bearing two different faces, two different names. William's participation in this whole affair is already implied by Bergenworth's leading the charge into the fishing hamlet and is further implicated by his statue in the surgery altar. After this point, the references to William are all but gone, symbolizing his break from the healing church whose work was continued by Lawrence. Bergenworth is a place of learning. They were funded by Kenhurst and their goal was always tied with exploration, both of the labyrinth itself and the secrets that it held. This includes the secrets of blood. The Healing Church was created by Willan, who led Bergenworth in the behest of Kenhurst, not only to help administer blood transfusions which, in practice, turned Yarnon into a glorified petri dish, but also to serve as a catalyst to amplify the effects of the experiments. Blood echoes are the dying wishes of the blood, its will, and stronger will generates stronger, thicker blood. Religious obsession would most certainly help them achieve more advanced results, which also explains the cleric's transformation into cleric beasts, since their fervorous belief imbues their blood with power. Lawrence may have been the first vicar, but, to this day, the vicars still answer to a higher power. Now it's the choir, but it used to be Bergenworth. With the blessing of Kenhurst Castle, Bergenworth was the driving force behind the facade that was the healing church, and William was its creator, its master. Willem is the father of the Healing Church. But why did he break from the Church? A logical, unassuming question with an answer that reaches farther than you could have imagined. The key, as always, is blood. Blood ministration creates the beasts and the hunters hunt them. It's just what hunters do. Ariana's blood, Kenhurst's blood, 
is said to be recognizable by a member of the old healing church as what was once forbidden, but its effects are very similar to the blood ministered by the church, very similar to the blood of the blood saints, who are chosen for their merits as a vessel for blood of a higher grade. Adeline, patient of the research hall, was one such blood saint once, already present during the early stages of the healing church, when Bergenworth was still under the umbrella of Kinghurst Castle. Kinghurst residents were in vibers of blood and Kinghurst not only beckoned the research, it also provided them with either the blood that was used in the grooming of blood scents or with the blood scents themselves. Willan was tasked with unlocking the secrets of the blood, but Kinghurst would not so easily give up the secret of its undying queen, especially to these outsiders. Willan was stumbling in the dark, but then there was cause, and with cause, the cord of the eye. The cord gave Willan his epiphany. What we need are more eyes. Eyes symbolize the truth Master Willan sought in his research. His sudden realization, the initial making of internal eyes, led him to further discoveries. It led him to a new line of thinking, turning away from blood research and linking the Great Ones to the ocean instead. He incorporated seawater into his experiments in the hopes that his patients would reach a greater insight into the nature of the Great Ones. One of his patients, in turn, had the realization of the milkweed rune, which boosts discovery and allows communion with the arcane arts. Regarding runes, the beast rune is stated to have been the first carry rune, but the milkweed rune is implied to not being a carry rune at all. Not only it was clearly envisioned by Adeline instead of carry, the Japanese description also says it was Adeline's but it was worthy of Carol, which leads me to believe that Carol was Adeline's brother mentioned in the brain fluids description, and that her initial breakthrough allowed him to transcribe further rooms, and the first one he'd transcribe himself would be the aforementioned beast room. The discovery of blood entailed the discovery of undesirable beasts. Discovery, or Haken, is used to describe milkweed and eye, which led to further discoveries and also metamorphosis and beast stating that discovery of blood led to evolution in undesirable beasts. Undesirable beasts is a very important distinction in the beast room. They were already researching blood and beasts, but they didn't know we were the beasts all along, and that it was a trait ingrained into human nature, as described by the later Clawmark room. Everything comes back full circle as blood initiated William's research, which led him into the Great One's research, and that eventually led to the discovery of blood to the truth about the old blood, which is what granted them the insight into the nature of the beast. That was the spark that led to William's departure and the fall of Kinghurst. So, what is old blood and how did they come to these conclusions? Well, old blood is, pure and simple, Kinghurst blood, the blood of Annalise coursing through their veins. Their adage says fear the old blood and, in Japanese, old blood is referenced as Kanete Chi. In this context, Kanete could be better translated as preliminary, as in the preliminary blood before its refinement through magical procedures, the body of the blood scents, or both. And how did they reach these conclusions? Well, that's where Maria comes in. Her dead corpse is a twofold symbol. On one hand, the only sign that she'd be dead is the dripping blood, but there's blood on her chalice as well. She was drinking it. She was literally blood drunk and got trapped inside the nightmare. She uses blood during the fight. She felt disillusioned by witnessing German's massacre of the fish folk and gave in to her bloodlust. The Rakuyo symbolized her distaste for blood and she threw it away because she couldn't bear it any longer. On the other hand, she's presented as a corpse, so she would have been killed by Willem and his associates, the first victim of the Kinhurst massacre. If she were there out of her own accord, if she still cared, wouldn't she answer to the plight of the patients? Simon can move about freely, why wouldn't she? The patients still call to her, literally begging at her door, but she's gone. She doesn't answer anymore. When she dies, the doll feels like heavy shackles have been lifted because the Maria we meet inside the nightmare represents her connection to her own blood-drunk past self. Maria led Willan to the truth about Kinghurst. This revelation led to Kinghurst reckoning, which is reflected inside the nightmare by the underground pile of corpses whose river of blood attracts the blood leakers. It led to the beast below the operation altar. The discovery of blood led to the discovery of undesirable beasts. 
Bergenworth had control over the population through the healing church, but they did not have control. They didn't control the old blood, the land, and they didn't control Kenhurst's most valuable prize, Annalise's cord of the eye. But all that was about to change. The church had already made great strides into controlling the denizens of the labyrinth, using blue elixirs to domesticate church servants. Among their ranks there was a Tumeran descendant who was given the name of Logarius. The healing church was already well established and heritifanaticism is a powerful driving force. A whisper of heresy, of a threat to the beloved church, would suffice. A secretive group was created, among them Ludwig, the first church hunter. His guiding moonlight is reflected by the executioner's radiance room and their golden ardeo which symbolizes luminosity. He took part in the massacre that would hunt his conscience and, after Logarius stayed behind, he'd take charge of all church hunters. Kinghurst denizens were branded heretical, a smoke screen to what amounts to nothing but a coup. They marched into the castle, unflinching, and the Kinghurst bloodline was no more. Just like it is wrongly assumed that Lawrence would have created the Healing Church, it is also wrongly assumed that Mikolash would have created the School of Menses. The School of Menses would have been around from a very early stage of the Healing Church. As symbolic as it may be, we can use the Hunter's Nightmare to establish the moment of its creation. In the Hunter's Nightmare, the location with the surgery altar represents the schism within the institutions. It is the last place where references to William can be found with the statues where he performs the ritualistic surgery, implanting eyes inside the skull of a patient. These experiments probably resulted, among other things, in the black sky eye wielded by the vicar standing watch in this room. This item is specifically stated to have been a creation of Bergenworth, and it would have been their first glimpse into the far reaches of the cosmos. When properly aligned, the altar will confine Willan to the now extinct research hall, while we get our first glimpse of the newly instituted Grand Cathedral. Furthermore, here, beneath it all, we can find Lawrence's human skull. This is the past oath that, in the end, could not be kept, which is further compounded by the vicar spewing an already modified version of the adage. This crossroads between William and Lawrence, the old and the new healing church, is an omen of Lawrence's fate. In this moment, he instituted the school of Mansis to continue their pursuit of communion for blood, which will lead him to breaking the oath he had made to William and result in the birth of the first cleric beast. This is the moment Lawrence keeps reminiscing, the moment he wishes he could go back to, but he can't. And the first order of the day after the school of Menses was created would be to lock away their secrets. Beneath this place, Brother, a church assassin whose only goal is to keep their secrets buried, awaits in his cell, where he spends his insight ringing a soundless bell in hopes of forgetting his past. Here. We can also find Yamamura in Antal. Yamamura, being a katana wielding Easterner, is probably the man who designed the Chikage and the Rakuyo. He would have been killed to keep the secrets surrounding Maria and Kenhurst. Antal is a Yahargu hunter defector, and would logically have been killed to keep the secrets surrounding the school of Menses. The general population in the lower ranks of the church weren't privy to the school's existence and inner workings, but they were the higher authority within the church and, at the very least, their direct subordinates would have known about them. The secret to be kept wasn't the school's existence, it was their goals and practices. Yargo village itself couldn't have been a secret. The village isn't just the stretch leading to Advent Plaza, the village is huge and the way to it, through the little cathedral, is overseen by the workshops. Unseen is, among other things, a reference to the unseen tombstone in the dream, which leads to it and is associated with places that are connected to nightmares and were later hidden from the world, that is, Yahargu, Kenhurst, and the old workshop. Mansi's ultimate goal of communion would have been dreamed up after reaching the nightmare from Tyr and the nightmare of Mansis. The latter being the stronger evidence, as it was named after the school itself. In the Hunter's Nightmare, the area that would have been Yahargu in the real world, to the right of the Grand Cathedral, is the area where all symbolism related to these nightmares can be found. Further evidence to pinpoint this point in time as the moment of creation of the School of Menses, just after William's departure in the fall of Kinghurst, but before the advent of Lawrence's burning death. 
in now, we kinda need to talk about patches. Yes, dead patches. Lore-wise, he's usually dismissed just for, you know, being patches, but I don't think that's wise, him being an in-game canonic character and all. And I think his participation in the lore is far more important than we were first led to believe. Mechanically, his in-game objective is to lead us into the Nightmare Frontier by giving us the Tones of Stone and teaching us the way to the amygdala that will transport us there. Well, he can also be found inside the labyrinth as a vendor NPC with unique dialogue and all. So, it's my belief that he was first found there by the Tomb Prospectors exploring in the name of the church and that he's the one that first led the School of Menses to the frontier as lambs to his god. Both the frontier and the Nightmare of Menses are reached through the lecture building where he waits to mock us on our way to his personal sacrifice. The lecture building itself is stated to be a Bergenworth building, but remember that Lawrence would have been granted safe passage to and from Bergenworth via the password gatekeeper. The gatekeeper was instituted by Willem, considering he was Willem's servant and that he stays on the forbidden wood side of the door, and the password itself is their shared adage. The parting words spoken by Willem and Lawrence themselves, the one you learn by touching Lawrence's school. Willem would pursue his own path, but he had no qualms partaking on Lawrence's discoveries. During these early stages, Lawrence would have made use of Bergenworth's better equipped installations while, at the same time, converting students into his own doctrine. Here, they performed a ritual that led into a higher plane of existence, the Nightmare Frontier. Later, the same ritual was expanded to bypass the unsurmountable distance to the mainland, creating, on the second floor, an entrance to the symbolic, even higher plane that would be the Nightmare of Maces. And all of this makes me wonder, is Patches the Burgundy Spider mentioned in that note? So, in the Nightmare of Maces they found the brain, a true great one. It was rotten and deemed unworthy, but it held a very important item the living string that would grant them passage to the lower depths of the labyrinth and to Queen Yarnon herself. All was well. Lawrence's efforts bore fruit and Mainz's ruled undisputed. Until the choir came along. Just like most things in Bloodborne, the choir is, at first, a big mystery. A faction within the healing church that came seemingly out of nowhere and would have risen to prominence after communion with Ebritas, daughter of the cosmos. Ebritas became a cornerstone of the group, but the choir itself would have been present before that. The birthplace of the choir was the orphanage. Its founding members were literal orphans, daughters of the massacre of Kenhurst Castle. The choir bell has already been previously linked to Annalise, but, at least to me, the greatest indication of their lineage would be the abundance of baby Ebritas that can be found at the orphanage. When the red moon hangs low, Ariana, descendant of Kenhurst, gives birth to one of these babies. The key to this eldritch liaison is her corrupt blood, as stated by the third umbilical cord that can be acquired from her. If her Kenhurst blood wasn't the key, then all women of Yarno would have given birth to baby great ones the first and second time the red moon was seen in the sky, but they didn't. The woman of the orphanage, on the other hand, apparently did. With the end of Kenhurst, they had to be kept around as a new, church-controlled source of old blood. During their early formative years, they would have been under the tutelage of Willen, but Willen eventually left, and even if they wanted to follow their teacher, they wouldn't be able to. The church would never allow it. And so they stayed. They grew and learned. In time, they became thinkers and scholars themselves. They delved into the depths of the labyrinth, but while Mansi sought communion with Yarnum, their gaze was fixed on something else. Their prize would be the left-behind great one, Ebritus. But gaining entrance to the lost land of East is a conundrum in itself. Logically, all chalices are kept in places or in the possession of entities that can be accessed prior to the exploration of their respective dungeons. Except for the great East Chalice. The Great East Chalice is held by Ebritas, and Ebritas resides with Finis. Then, how could the choir have gained access to the chalice in order to have audience with her? Well, they continued the work that began at Bergenworth, and building upon the accumulated knowledge left by Willem, Carol, and Adeline, they looked toward the skies. 
through the inside of the milkweed room with the use of cost parasites, they became seedbeds for phantasms and uncovered the nature of the celestial attendant. They transformed into the king and beckoned the celestial emissary. The emissary brought them into the dungeon and introduced them to his mistress, a new Eldritch liaison had been forged. The note in the lecture building says three third chords, so there were three causes, analyses, and yarnums. Imposter Yosefka enters labor with the appearance of the Red Moon, meaning that she is also a Kinghurst descendant. Her chord says that Provost Willem sought the chord in order to elevate his being and thoughts to those of a great one. This being a Kinghurst chord, it would mean that Willem was sought Analyse's chord. The chord itself would have originated in Analyse's long dead child, the bastard of Lauren. Lawrence left with Annalisa's cord as it was connected to the blood that William wanted to distance himself from. Later, the school of Mansis, under Lawrence's leadership, acquired another cord from Yarnan. But the ascension of the choir must have generated resentment among the ranks. Their existence was likely a catalyst for Mikulash. They've all gone soft. Oh, step up. He began sowing dissent among the members of the school of Mansis and eventually stole Annalisa's cord from Lawrence. They didn't know who the culprit was, as such things are done in secrecy. The choir had been spying on Mansis, but either there was nothing they could have done, or they simply didn't care. Another note in the lecture building says that Lawrence back on the Red Moon. It was his ritual, not Mikolaj's. Willem awaited his Lunarian, German at the workshop, and Mikolaj at the unseen village, but they didn't know the full extent of what the ritual entailed. Lawrence performs the moon ritual. Kenhurst's descendants give birth to baby great ones. Mansis gets lost in the nightmare. Lawrence turns into a cleric beast and dies at the Grand Cathedral. The moon presence beckons the hunters and German is lost to the waking world. Ron, his ascendant, contains the ritual. All of this while old Yarden burns. And then, in the long aftermath, most hunters are no longer under the rule of the church the ones that are quickly devoted to beasts. The hunter workshops are eventually dismantled. The old church workshop used to protect them, but without Lawrence, there's nothing to stop the choir from taking over the church. They cut access to the old abandoned workshop and dubbed the woods for beaten ground. A new status quo is established. The nights grow long as the unruly moon-scented hunters slowly fade away. The blood ministers don't even remember them anymore. But every hunt needs a hunter, and then, one day... Ah, you found yourself a hunter. So, this is it for this episode. Next, we can start unveiling the events that take place after the game has started, our hunter's journey. Thank you all for watching. A big thanks to my patrons, especially Vinny and John. If you want to help this channel grow, you can join them at my Patreon. The link is in the description. Or you can just share with your friends. Everybody's welcome aboard. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. Until next time, see ya.